All right, guys, welcome back. This is section 1.3 of the uh, Introduction to Criminal Justice, and uh, we're going to talk about the process of the criminal justice system, okay? So I explained last time how there are all these dozens and dozens of different criminal justice systems throughout the country. There's the federal system, there's the state system, there's the local system, and they're all different, okay? They all have to abide by some certain rules, but they're all different. So this is going to be a very general, um, very, uh, uh, this is what normally happens uh, kind of, of lecture, okay? Um, it is, it is not this same way every time. In some jurisdictions, it's going to be slightly different. In other jurisdictions, it's going to be slightly different in a different way, right? But this is a good kind of general outline of what happens and in what order and what you have to do and what the kind of whole process is. Um, and this is basically specifically for a felony level crime, okay? We haven't talked about the different levels of crime yet, but the felonies are the, the big ones, the... You know, the ones where you can get sent to prison for more than a year, okay? Um, so, um, the first thing that has to happen is a crime has to occur, right? None of this can, can go on unless a crime occurs. Um, and that crime can be anything from murder on down, right? Um, but then kind of the second thing, or number one on this list, is arrest, okay? You get arrested. Um, a police officer shows up, puts handcuffs on you, you're going to jail. Sucks for you. Alright, so who's in charge at this stage? It's the police, right? The police are the ones that get to determine who gets arrested and who doesn't, okay? Once they arrest you, and they put you in the back of a squad car, and they drive you down to the police station, and there's a process called booking, okay? Now, um, anybody who's, you know, maybe some of the older viewers will remember, uh, I think it was Dragnet, where they, you know, they walk into the police station with a, a bad guy in handcuffs and they say, book him, Dano, All right? Booking is the process of A, establishing their identity, and B, listing their charges, okay? So, um, to establish their identity, um, you know, the old school thing is, you know, the fingerprints, and then the... Um, the the mug shot, right? Everybody gets those those fancy mug shots. Um, I've never been arrested, so I can't I can't show off a, a mug shot. But you know, hey, maybe one day. Um, so they establish your identity. You know, are you who you say you are? Are you Bob Smith? Are you John Doe? Right? Um, and they'll they'll put you in a jail cell, um, and then they will list your charges, right? Which is going to be different based on what they caught you doing, right? Um, and, and you can have multiple counts of the same charge, right? Um, so let's say you punched four people, right? You got in a big bar fight, you punched four people right in the face. Um, if the police think they can, they have enough evidence to charge you, if they have enough probable cause to charge you um, with each of those assaults, they can charge you with four counts of assault, right? It means you have committed assault four times or against four different people. Make sense? Um, so they, um, once the booking process is done, um, the police are no longer in charge, right? You're still sitting in a jail cell, but now the police are no longer in charge. They turn the case over to the district attorney. Most jurisdictions call their kind of head prosecutor the district attorney, um, but there are a few different names. Like in the federal system, they're not called the district attorney, they're called the U.S. attorney. Right? And these are the guys, they're lawyers, and they're the guys or girls who are in charge of prosecuting uh, uh, the, the offender or the defendant. Right? Um, so the district attorney is a charge at the second step, which is pre-trial um, um, and, and who is going to trial. Right? So the first thing that happens to you as the defendant is you show up for what's called the first appearance. Okay? This is your first time standing in front of a judge and you say you know um, the judge will say um, you know you so and so you're arrested for this um, I'm going to set your bail at X amount of money and the judge has very wide discretion on how much uh, bail money uh, they're gonna set for your case it can be anything from no bail to you know ten dollars up through a million dollars or they can deny bail entirely and they have very, very wide 
um, um, ability to, to determine what that bail is going to be set at. Not complete, but very, very wide discretion. Um, and bail is a very misunderstood thing. Um, the basic, basic story of bail is that, you know, let's say I committed some crime and the judge sets my bail at $1,000. That means I give the court $1,000 of my money as a guarantee that I will show up for trial if they have one, right? If they decide not to charge me or not to take me to trial, I get that bail money back. When I show up for trial, I get that bail money back. It's only, it's basically me loaning the government money as a, a method to ensure that I will come back. Um, because if I don't come back, they get to keep the money and then I'm out that money and that's bad for me, right? But what if I can't afford a thousand dollars bail? Then I go to a guy named a bail bondsman, and I give him ten percent of my bail money. So in this case, if it's a thousand dollars bail, ten percent is that's right, a hundred bucks. I give the bail bondsman a hundred bucks. He puts up the entire thousand dollars, right, to the court. Now, when I come back for trial, he gets his thousand dollars back, but I don't get my hundred dollars back from him. Right? So he's made $100 profit. But if I don't come for trial, he's out 900 bucks. So that's when he hires a bounty hunter to come find me and make sure I show up for trial. But we'll talk more about bail in a, in a future chapter. But at the first appearance, my bail is set. Now, the district attorney has to go through this process of getting an indictment. Okay? In other words, he has to convince either a judge or a grand jury or some kind of group of people um, that there is enough probable cause to send me to trial. Now, probable cause is, is not, it's a much lower standard than what you face in court, right? In a criminal trial in the United States, the evidentiary standard that the prosecution has to reach in order to get a conviction is beyond a reasonable doubt, right? At this stage in the game, we're not to the trial yet, he doesn't need to show beyond a reasonable doubt. The prosecutor just has to show probable cause. In other words, is there enough evidence that we need to go to trial? Right? Not proving it beyond a reasonable doubt. Just, is there just enough to say, yeah, we should take that to trial. And there's two different systems in place for getting this indictment. The first is a grand jury. Um, a grand jury is just kind of what it sounds like. It's a jury of people um, that aren't there for any one particular case. They're there to hear a whole bunch of these indictments from district attorneys. So the district attorney will come and say, look, okay, here's a case. Here's my evidence. Do you think this is enough probable cause? And the grand jury will say, yes or no. Um, and then another district attorney will come in and say, okay, here's my probable cause for this case. Do you think there's enough to go to trial? And the grand jury will say, yes or no. Um, but it's so they're not deciding whether you're guilty or not guilty. They're just deciding on the probable cause and whether it's enough to go to trial. The other system is the preliminary hearing, which is a very similar system, but with a judge instead of a, a grand jury. So let's assume I have gone to my first appearance. I've gotten bail. The, the district attorney has gone in front of a grand jury or a judge or whoever and gotten that indictment. What's the next stage in the process? The next stage in the process is adjudication, or the trial, right? I love Diet Coke. Um, Diet Coke does not sponsor this channel, um, but if anybody knows somebody that works at Coca-Cola and you could get them to sponsor the channel, that would be awesome. Um, so, we're going to trial. Who's in charge now? The judge, okay? The district attorney is still a part of the process, he or one of the lawyers who works for him is going to be the prosecution um, in, in your, your trial, um, but the judge is in charge, okay? Once the trial starts, the judge is in charge. And the first part of the trial is what's called the arraignment, okay? Once again, I show up in court, uh, I show up with my lawyer, um, uh, the judge is there and the judge says, you know, Bob Smith, you have been charged with four counts of assault and, you know, one count of this and two counts of that. And then here's the really important part. He says, how do you plea? Okay. And I have three choices here. I can plead guilty. I can plead not guilty. Or I can plead what's called nolo contendere, which is essentially pleading guilty, but I'm not really pleading guilty. 
And we'll talk more about it in, in a later chapter. Um, but those are my three choices. So if I plead guilty, we, we skip straight to the, the sentencing and sanctions part. If I plead not guilty, we have a trial. Okay? The trial happens. The judge determines what evidence is admitted, what evidence is not admitted. The prosecution presents their case. The defense presents their case. And then a jury decides um, whether you are guilty or not guilty. And it's usually a 12-person jury. And they usually have to be a unanimous decision to find you guilty. Um, but let's assume, for the sake of argument, I do get found guilty. Okay. Now we move on to the fourth step. Now, the judge is still in charge here, but this is a totally different phase of the trial, so the judge's job is completely different. Okay, During the adjudication phase, the judge's job is to determine, is, is to make sure both sides play by the rules. Right? They're the referee. They're the ones saying, okay, the prosecution, you're not allowed to violate his rights. The defense, you're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to do that. Right? So the judge is the referee. Now in the sentencing phase, the judge is no longer the referee. The judge is no longer an unbiased you know, person there to make sure that the, the, the rules are followed. It also doesn't happen directly after the trial, right? On TV shows and movies, a lot of times you'll see, you know, the juror comes back and says, Your Honor, we find the defendant guilty. And the judge looks at the defendant and says, Oh, defendant, I sentence you to five years in prison. Boom. Like, immediately. That's not how it happens in real life. In real life, there's a delay, okay? Once they come back with a not guilty verdict, or the, I'm sorry, once they come back with a guilty verdict, the judge will say, Okay, we're going to reconvene a day from now, a week from now, a month from now, however long from now, and we're going to have sentencing. And in that intervening time, the judge kind of researches you and the crime you committed and reads statements by the victim and reads about, you know, how many crimes have you committed in the past and gets all this information. And then they get to come in and determine your punishment. And this is based on a lot of things, right? It's dependent on the crime that you're convicted of, whether it was particularly heinous or whether there was some mitigating circumstance and um, it, it's going to depend on how many crimes you've been convicted of in the past, and it's going to depend on a lot of things, but the judge is going to take all those factors into consideration, they're going to look at it all, and then they're going to give you a punishment. And this punishment can range from, say, a fine, or community service, or some kind of low-level thing like that, to prison time, right, anything from, you know, a day in jail to life in prison, and in the United States, depending on your state, they can even still go up to the death penalty, right? Meaning the state is going to kill you. Um, and, and that punishment is at the discretion of the judge, but there are, there, there are limits on what they can do, right? So if you're convicted of one count of assault, the judge cannot use his or her discretion to give you the death penalty, right? They have to work within a certain frame, but then within that frame, they can they can give you a fairly wide range of punishments, depending on the crime, depending on the jurisdiction, depending on a lot of things. Um, so the judge has this window of what they're allowed to sentence you to, and they get to pick within that window um, what your punishment is. And then, of course, step five is corrections. Your punishment is enforced, okay? Whether that's probation whether that's um, prison time, whether it's, you know, whatever that punishment is, a fine, the death, whatever, um, that is the last step in the process. And once that punishment has been assessed, once you're done, you are no longer under the control of the government, right? You are no longer in this process. You're done. You're out, okay? So, Come back, and uh, next time we're going to talk just a little bit more about um, uh, kind of the introduction to the criminal justice system. See you then.